Chapter Sixteen of Mag and Margaret: A Story for Girls by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Hard Lesson. There is one person who will doubtless never forget her ride home from the picnic. Every step the horses took seemed to cause her pain. Ned Saunders was back with easy carriage and the village doctor before even the impatient party who waited had begun to watch for him over the hill. Everything that could be done for Margaret's comfort was thought of, and her aunt, who had come in the carriage, pillowed the poor girl's head on her lap all the long, slow drive home. But at best it was a hard time. The doctor was as cheery as possible before Margaret, told her that she had had first-rate attention already, that the hot water was just the thing for her foot, and that they would soon have her in a place where they could make her more comfortable. But he shook his head in answer to Frederick's questions, and told him that he was afraid there was a long, weary time for the poor girl, and that it was even doubtful whether she would ever jump again. "'That knee was bent in an ugly way,' he said, and sometimes these jumps make serious business. However, she is young and strong, and we will hope for the best. The best was a serious trial to Margaret. The hurts all proved to be tedious in their results, rather than serious. At least, the city doctor, who was called in consultation, said he hoped the young lady would be as well as ever in a few months. But he might almost as well have said years, so far as Margaret was concerned. She had never been ill for more than three days at a time in her life, and the prospect of lying still for months was so utterly hopeless to her that she turned her face away from them all, and, after murmuring that she would much rather have been killed outright, cried herself into a nervous headache. With this for a beginning, it will be easily understood that she did not make a very cheerful patient. Indeed, as the days went by, and their anxiety in regard to her wore off, it began to be very hard for her nurses to listen to her continual fretting. She blamed the doctors and the roads and the ponies, the boys for going after apples and leaving them to take care of themselves, and the girls for going with her, and Dick for allowing them to go, and even the gypsies for having been in camp at the time. Frederick Ainsworth considered himself a model nurse because he gave up so much of his vacation to her, and his aunt commended him for patience and forbearance. But there were times when poor Margaret accused him of thinking only of himself. On the whole, there was no one at the boarding-house but earnestly hoped that the sick one would improve very rapidly, and grow able to go back to town where she longed to be. Of all who had to do with her, the one whose conduct was the most surprising, to those who knew her well, was Meg Jessup. As a matter of course, Meg had occasion to be in Margaret's room very often during the day. It was she who toiled upstairs with the broths and toasts, and cool drinks and warm drinks, and fruits that were in some shape or other nearly always in demand for that room. It was she who sat in the room while Margaret's aunt went down to dinner. It was she who kept the flies from troubling Margaret while the aunt took an afternoon nap. In short, it was she who was called upon for all the extra and many of the regular services demanded by the invalid. She performed every duty with painstaking care. She might have been a wound-up clock, so regularly did she go about the work that became routine. Yet Frederick Ainsworth knew, and Miss Ordway knew, and Margaret's aunt surmised, that the Meg who was attending Margaret was not the same Meg who had been doing errands all summer. There was almost never a smile on her little brown face as she came into the room. She offered no words except those that were absolutely necessary. She stayed not one second beyond the time demanded of her by duty. Margaret herself noticed the difference, or at least disapproved of the present Meg. I would as soon be waited on by a tombstone, she said petulantly one day, when Meg had brought her a glass of water fresh from the spring, had stood silently by while she drank it, and silently retreated from the room the instant the glass was returned to her tray. I wish there was some one to wait on me who didn't look as though she expected to die because of it. Why can't Jane come up with things, or Kate Perkins for that matter? My dear, said her aunt soothingly, Remember that Mrs. Perkins has a large family, and not a great deal of help. 
Jane has her hands very full. As for Kate Perkins, I suppose she would tell you that she is not hired to wait upon her mother's boarders, though she does come often, you know. Not very. They are all a selfish set. And it was just as much their fault as mine. If they hadn't wanted to go to that horrid old gypsy camp, I shouldn't have gone. Kate Perkins ought not to feel above waiting on me, I'm sure. If my mother kept boarders for a living, I should expect to do my share of it. Anyway, I wish I could have somebody besides that horrid little Mag. She is a very solemn-looking little girl, certainly, the aunt admitted. But she is neat and quiet. I wonder if anything has happened to the child. I used to think she had more life in her. She had life enough at the picnic, said Margaret. She chattered and giggled all the time. Fred made an idiot of himself petting her. It was his fault that she went along. My dear, what harm did it do? The poor child can't have many outings, and she was certainly not to blame for your accident. She was the only one who didn't go with you, was she not? Good reason why. She had to stay and take care of the dishes. We were sure she knew how to do that. But, Margaret, dear, didn't she offer? Surely none of you were cruel enough to force the little creature's homeless and dependent position on her by obliging her to stay behind and do the work. Margaret turned irritably on her pillow as she said, "'Oh, Aunt Helen, please don't talk about her any more. She is a stupid little owl, and I'm tired of the sound of her name.' It was Miss Ordway who broke in upon Meg's established order of things. Her city friends, by the way, had come, a young married lady with her two young sisters in charge. More winsome girls than Elise and Elsie Duane would be hard to find. Money had been in plenty, or at least their parents had. Meg Jessup heard the elder portion of the family talk so often about this that she was in danger of getting a very false idea of the importance of wealth. But the girls themselves were as simple and sweet as the wild flowers they delighted in. If they wore elegant dresses in town, as Margaret Lancaster declared that they did, they had left them all behind, and appeared in the morning in the freshest and neatest of percale dresses, while their very best were of white muslin simply made. Elise was nearly a year older than Mag, and Elsie was quite a year younger, but both of them seemed to find an immediate attraction in the shy, brown little girl who had never been to school and who knew so much less and so much more than most girls her age. They found their way often to the back porch, where Mag still sat with her endless fruits and vegetables, and many were the talks the three had together. Poor Margaret Lancaster, in her upstairs prison, would have been sick with envy could she have seen them, for to meet and become intimate friends with the Duane girls had been one of the thoughts that had lately reconciled her to this summer in the country. But I meant to tell you of Miss Ordway and Mag. The little girl came one morning to bring Miss Ordway a fresh pitcher of spring water, and stopped to smell of a sweet pea that had been placed on the canvas the day before. "'It seems as though it could be smelled,' she said gleefully. "'How can there be sweet peas so lovely as that, without being sweet? Oh, Miss Ordway, it is so wonderful to think you can do it. If you could only make them smell, wouldn't it be too beautiful?' "'I presume it would.' said Miss Ordway, smiling at her enthusiasm. Then she seized the opportunity to ask questions that had been troubling her. "'Are there two little Mags in this house, do you think?' Meg looked her surprise. "'Oh, no, ma'am,' she said. "'I know there are not. There is Miss Margaret Lancaster, you know, of course, but nobody ever calls her Mag, and besides that there is only me.' "'I don't quite know how to account for it.' said Miss Ordway, arranging flowers for her vase, and seeming to not give a great deal of heed to what she was saying. There is a little Meg who comes to my room with the brightest face. When she brings me water it is always done with a smile, as though she was glad to bring it, and when she sees any of my pretty things her face lights up with pleasure, and altogether she is a very pleasant sight to look at but occasionally in Miss Margaret's room I find a little girl called Meg, whose face is so very sober that it seems much longer than the face that I know, and as nearly as I can discover she never laughs in that room, nor says a cheery word. 
can she possibly be the same mag and if she is how does she account for the difference mag did not laugh then instead she blushed until her cheeks were as red as the roses miss ordway was arranging it was clear that she did not want to make any answer but miss ordway kept silence and waited at last meg said in a voice that was low and timid it is because i love you miss ordway that is very nice i am sure i like to be loved but does that mean that you do not love miss margaret yes um it does i don't love her the least bit in the world and i don't want to say any words to her only just what i have to and i haven't got any smiles when i am where she is and don't want to have miss ordway turned and looked at her curiously what a fierce little creature it is after all she said as if thinking aloud who would have supposed it then to mag little girl what is the matter what has poor margaret done to arouse such wrath i supposed you would be all melted into pity for her i don't pity her said mag in severest tone she brought it all on herself and made trouble for everybody and broke mr saunders's wagon and lamed one of the ponies and was hateful and horrid miss ordway could not help laughing so you think you must punish her for such selfish and inconsiderate conduct do you my child if mr saunders has forgiven her one would suppose you might don't you know that he has sent her fruit several times and the most lovely flowers and has promised to take her out to ride after those same ponies as soon as she is able it isn't that said mag lowering her voice again she wasn't at all good to me i don't think i have any reason to like her or to try to be pleasant to her and then miss ordway resolved to know what it was all about and questioned until mag poured out her tale of woe as revealed to her by laura woodruff in truth the lady after the first revelations were made had no difficulty in understanding the situation she had seen enough of margaret lancaster to know that she could be very disagreeable when she chose still it was a pity to see a little girl take the follies of another little girl so deeply to heart what could be said to lessen the effect suddenly an idea occurred to the lady how do such feelings as those match with your new book she said turning and looking at meg with a winning smile ma'am said mag bewildered which book do you mean why the bible didn't you tell me something about following the directions in the bible as soon as you found them out how do the directions about margaret lancaster match your conduct is there something about margaret lancaster in the bible no words will describe the note of astonishment and also of dismay in poor mag's voice despite the undertone of pathos miss ordway could not help smiling i'm pretty sure there is she said positively let me see if i can find it for you she looked about for her bible and blushed a little over the fact that it was nowhere to be seen manifestly she did not order her daily life by its teachings she remembered carrying a pile of books a few days before to stow away in a large trunk in her closet the bible must have been among them and she had not missed it she went down into the depths of the trunk and pulled it out but now she did not know where to look for the promised words however the bible had a concordance attached and mag leaning over the lady's shoulder had its mysteries explained to her by its aid the verse was found and read aloud i say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust for if ye love them which love you what reward have ye do not even the publicans the same who said that exclaimed poor mag almost breathless with astonishment and pain who was it talking miss ordway it was the lord jesus when he was on earth will you let me look at it asked mag and she read each word again with painstaking slowness pausing only to ask one question who are the publicans miss ordway the publicans repeated that lady hesitatingly 
why i presume in that connection it means outsiders people who do not pretend to order their lives by the bible it is a very easy matter you know to love people who love us and are good and kind to us but jesus wanted his followers to do a great deal more than that and then quite to miss ordway's relief mag was called in peremptory tones by mrs perkins in two minutes more i should have been beyond my depth thought miss ordway smiling as the door closed after mag i wonder what ward would think to hear me trying to preach a sermon from a bible text poor little mouse i have given her a hard lesson to learn one that i couldn't practice myself to save my life i wonder what she will do with it she might well have asked never in all her fourteen years of life had such a bitter truth been pressed upon mag's notice she ignored the history of england entirely and finding the words in her own little bible read and re-read them at every leisure interval until they were burned into her memory and their meaning grew plain as she studied she was actually told to love margaret lancaster if it had not been for that word meg might have got some comfort after an hour or two she admitted to her conscience that she could pray for margaret and do good to her in a sense she had been doing good to her all the time but to love her that was simply impossible yet it said that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven and what did that mean if not that people who refused to obey the orders would not be counted his children End of chapter 16